So you want to be Hitler, but you don't want to accidentally end up getting admitted into art school and wasting all your time. Well, this is the game for you. Secret Hitler has been widely popular due to its ability to make friends get extremely angry at each other over the most minute details and having you be able to make it up immediately after. What we're going to do here is show you all of the lore surrounding this bad boy, as well as key strategies for you to win as both the liberal and the fascist parties, as well as one liberal strategy that has never lost any time we've used it. So let's get into it. First, for those of you not aware of the whole World War II thing, I'll show you the lore surrounding this little game. It's 1932, and you're pre-World War II Germany. Players are German politicians attempting to hold a fragile liberal government together and stem the rising tide of fascism. Watch out, though. There are secret fascists among you, and one secret Hitler. So how you play Scary Hitler is that one person is always the president, while that president attempts to elect a chancellor. Every time the president tries to elect a chancellor, every other player that isn't these two votes. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, nine, nine, whatever the heck you're feeling at the moment. Depending on the amount of votes, that chancellor is either voted in or voted out. And at that point, the voted in, the game can continue. If they're voted out, the presidency goes to the next person, and the cycle continues. Once a chancellor has been voted in, the president takes out three of these little policy cards, which allows the government to try and move forward. They then, without showing anybody else, take a look at the policy cards, choose two that they will pass to the chancellor, and pass those over secretly to the person who was elected. They then take a look at the two policy cards, choose which one they want to enact, and lay it face up on the respective board. They will then discard the other card, and they will be free to explain whether or not they had a choice, whether or not they're lying about which one they put down, before the presidency goes clockwise to the next person. This gameplay loop continues until one of the winning strategies is achieved. Any liberal will win the game if either five liberal policies are enacted or Hitler is assassinated. On the other side, any fascist will win the game if either six fascist policies are enacted or Hitler is elected as the chancellor once the third fascist policy is enacted, so right before you hit the red spaces. Fun fact, Hitler's design in this game is actually based on his real-world appearance. Hitler was not a standard man, as you might think, but rather a humanoid reptile person similar to Cobra Commander in G.I. Joe. Now that you know how to win as both teams, let's go over some common strategies that you can use in order to make sure that your team comes out on top, starting with the Liberals. To win as a liberal, you need to be able to sniff out any fascists that are pretending to be on your team. And a good way to do this is by staying quiet and observing everybody. You also want to be wary of early game plays. If a liberal president gets this combination of articles, they'll end up sticking with these two and give the chancellor a choice between them in order to determine whether they're a liberal or a fascist. The fascist is likely going to play a liberal card, which will prevent them from being discovered so early and give them a little bit of credibility on top of that, so you do not want to fall for these early game plays. Give more weight to plays later down in the game, such as when we're about the fourth mark or about the third fascist. As a liberal, you also want to know your odds for the cards. As you can see, much more of these are red than there are blue. About 66% of the cards in total are fascists instead of liberals being about a 33%. So it is much more likely that a person is going to draw three fascist cards at any given point than just happening to draw three liberals. Keep an eye out because if somebody says that they got nothing but fascist cards, they may not be lying. Liberals also need to be wary of the different types of fascists. There are two, and this is a very important distinction. There is your standard fascist, and then there is Hitler. While they are on the same team, they have very different play styles. The fascists know who each other are and know who Hitler is, but Hitler does not know who his teammates are, so he is going to be very confused throughout the match trying to find his teammates. Good fascists reveal themselves to Hitler without giving themselves away, but not everybody is going to be able to do this on a game-by-game -game basis. Look out for fascists who are acting strange towards one particular player, or always being on their side at all times. And look out for the player who is most likely more confused about who they're going to vote for on any given point. He may be trying to fish out his teammates. The last strategy that you should be aware of as a liberal is to know who you're playing with and read your opponents. 
over the course of several games, which you're likely to do because this game is actually a lot of fun, is that independent players will develop their own specialized playstyles. One person may end up being more quiet than others. One person may end up being more loud than others. More, one person may be more keen to accuse people quicker. But it is important to keep in mind all of these distinctions, as when a person starts to play differently, that's when something is up. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to criminal mind your way out of every situation, but keeping a key eye on the people that you play with a bunch, picking up on their quirks, and being able to exploit those when they start doing things a little bit differently will offer you a huge bonus. Now that you know how to play as the good guys, let's completely switch the entire thing around and instead learn how to play as the fascists. The fascists are normally the more fun team to play as, as you are the ones trying to sow discontent among your friends, and that is what leads to the fun reactions that you get to watch as you sit comfortably behind your lies. So in order to not waste these opportunities that you have, I'm gonna tell you how to better operate as a fascist. To start, you want to blend in. You want to be behind the green team. Everything they do, you're, oh yeah, that's how I think too. Wow, that's so crazy. Do not immediately come out the gate and start accusing people of stuff. That paints a massive target on their back, and it also paints a massive target on your back. So right at the beginning of the game, you are one of two suspicious people that people are going to have their eyes on for the entire rest of the playthrough. Another trick that you will already have picked up on from being a liberal is knowing your odds. Just like before, the fascist policies are 66% in the pile to the liberals 33. So you are more likely to get a bunch of fascist policies instead of a bunch of liberals. So being able to convince people that you just got a bunch of fascists, I don't know what to tell you, it's gonna be a lot easier. Being that you are on the team with less people, you're gonna try and want to get the win early, but this can be a very bad play if you don't know how to do it right. Getting up to the third fascist policy is going to be pretty easy due to how many of these are actually fascist policies themselves. So a couple are likely to get in there just due to odds at any random given point. Once this is here, you may be tempted to try and elect Hitler as chancellor immediately in order to get out of this situation before you get discovered. But do not move too quick. Suddenly getting very excited about how you have to elect this guy, it's just the best situation for everybody, is going to raise a lot of suspicion fast. So instead, continue with the game as normal and just be like, we're really falling behind at this point. We just gotta really stick together and figure this out. And on that end, don't be afraid to just go for the policy win. If you're comfortable in your situation, Hitler isn't even suspicious, and this guy is the only one who's raising any suspicion, just sit in the background and wait for these to keep popping up. People are gonna start dropping dead, and as long as you or Hitler has not raised any suspicion, it's likely that you're not gonna get chosen, especially if you've been swaying distrust the whole game. So just keep piling it up, and when the time comes, execute that monumental backstab that gives you and your team the advantage they need to go for the win. Subtle changes to the way you play can go unnoticed and represent a huge boost to the chance that you won't be discovered. The facial expression game is a key example of this. While you expect nobody to be watching, people are always watching if they know what they're doing. So if a liberal policy goes down, don't start cheering out like your team just won the big game. Instead, a subtle slight smile will do a lot better for those people who don't think you're acting. At the same time, if a fascist policy goes down, a little discontented eye twitch or a small frown is going to do a lot better than just saying, Oh, no! While this may go unnoticed by most of the players, if even one person picks up on these, they will be able to formulate in their head the conclusion that he's not been acting this entire game. He's clearly on our right team, and that's exactly how you get him. Another big part is confidence. Confidence is key in every decision you make in this game. Get this hand as a fascist president, and you want to make sure that your buddy chancellor doesn't end up putting a liberal down? You need to be able to convince them that you didn't have a choice either because you're not giving them one. How do you do this? Just be honest. You didn't have a choice. It's going to go over a lot better if you say, yeah, I didn't have a choice either, rather than going with it as, yeah, I didn't get a choice either, so I didn't really, couldn't really give you any there. 
Being confident in every lie that you tell is going to help out supremely over the course of the game with how many parts of this game rely on lying. Make subtle jabs at your opponents to sow distrust instead of saying, yeah, I think you've done it. You've been suspicious the entire game. Be like, well, Jerry said that Marco has been suspicious for quite a while now. And sow the distrust between those two instead of you keeping the target off your back. Now that I've given you some general strategies for both teams, let me go into some specialty options for each one in case you run into a situation that calls for it. Starting off with the fascists. The special strategy for the fascists hinges on the fact that Hitler cannot be discovered as his death is an auto loss. So what we are gonna be looking for is the fascist self Elam. If the liberals start to get a little too suspicious of the player that is Hitler, you can out yourself to take the pressure off of him. But this is gonna need to be handled extremely well, otherwise things will go very south fast. So what you're gonna wanna do is start making suspicious plays. Start accusing people, and if possible, play a fascist card if a choice has been given to you. But during these plays, you need to make some sort of ham-fisted attempt to defend yourself. Make it bad enough to not be believed, but good enough to show that you at least tried to defend yourself in this situation. If you just show up and say, I'm a fascist, ooh, 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 the crowd will grow suspicious as to why you revealed yourself. That's why the self-elimination needs to be handled with care. If you just out yourself for no reason, people are going to be really suspicious as to why you're doing this, and possibly grow wise as to who you're trying to protect. The end game of this strategy is to ham-fistedly reveal yourself in a way that doesn't raise suspicion on the actual person playing Hitler. Because what you want to do is get yourself killed. But don't just go out and get yourself killed by anyone. You want this guy to play a key part in the decision of your death. The death of a fascist by the hand of Hitler is going to have a really good impact on the group perception of him, as he played a key part in getting rid of one of the bad guys, allowing a good chunk of suspicion to be removed from his profile. Now that you've set him up as a person that might be able to be trusted, in times of desperation, the liberal team is going to look for any advantage that they can get their hands on, and may choose to look towards a trusted liberal ally in order to enact a good policy that could change the game. One of the few people that can be trusted at this point in time is someone who has killed a fascist before, the man that you have put into that position, Hitler which, when needed to make a crucial play for the liberal team, can immediately stab them in the back and either give a supreme advantage to the fascists, or just win the game altogether if you've reached that point in the game. Above all else, he needs to stay alive, so if you need to kill yourself in order to do that, by all means, go ahead, buddy. While the fascist special strategy can be of situational use, the liberal special strategy is a much more powerful tool that has resulted in an auto-win for the liberal team every time it's been implemented. The Circle. Secret Hitler is a game due to the fascists being able to sow distrust among the liberal team to disguise themselves. So if we remove the ability for them to sow, the fascists are rendered completely powerless. Basically, what the circle does is remove any team setup ability and forces everyone to trust in only the diplomatic process. How it works is that before the game starts, everyone agrees that anyone that goes against the circle is a suspicious person and should not be trusted. Then, whoever gets the president first will immediately grant the chancellorship to the person next to them in the clockwise order. Everybody must vote this person in in order for them to not be labeled immediately suspicious. So it goes through. After whichever policy is voted in, the next turn progresses, and here's where the circle comes into play. In the game, nobody that was either president or chancellor can be elected chancellor on the next turn, disallowing both of the previous people from being chancellor. However, this rule does not apply to the presidency as it automatically moves in a clockwise position. So our previous chancellor is now the president and that president will now give the chancellorship to the next person in line. They get voted in because nobody is allowed to go against the circle without raising suspicion, and the game continues on. This circular motion continues throughout the entire game, following the clockwise position and the next person always being voted in. 
Since the next chancellor is already determined based on the circular order, nobody will get the chance to start throwing out lies or discontent among the members because the next person is already voted in. You don't have a say in who the next person is. This grants a great amount of power to the liberal team as now they're freely able to trust everybody instead of trying to pick out a veritable who's who among the miscontents. But it also has a very powerful effect on the fascist power system. Normally, when you reach a fascist power system, such as the president being able to investigate a player's party card, this could cause huge problems for the liberal team if a fascist is the one to get this power, as they can now out a liberal as a fake fascist, or out a fascist as a fake liberal, causing even more confusion. What the circle does to this strategy is completely negate it. Because no matter who you investigate or what that person says about that person, they will be voted in regardless because of how the circle works. So it doesn't matter if any lies are told. You'll just be more suspicious of that person in a method that eliminates the need for suspicion. Where it really shines is in the ability to negate the president picks the next presidential candidate. If a fascist comes into contact with this power, they now have the opportunity to implement either one of their buddies in as the next president and get rid of any ability for the liberals to do anything about it. As well as if they've made themselves out to be a liberal, they could get the next presidency power and really cause issues due to their ability to discard the liberal policies. What is instead going to happen is the next president will get to pick the presidential candidate. Awesome, you know what that means? The next president has to pick the next person in the circle line and it continues as normal, completely negating the power. At this point, say three fascist policies come up and the president has to execute a person. Well, let's see what you've got in this situation now. The circle demands that whenever you have to execute a person, you execute the person right behind you, as they are going to be not able to get back into power through the circle because there's not enough game left. Well, that is not possible here for the fascist team because if the fascist president executes this guy, Hitler, they automatically lose the game. So they're going to have to shoot someone that isn't this person, outing one of them as possibly Hitler, or at the very least, them both as fascists. At this point, the circle has worked its magic, and you have found two of the three fascists. Congratulations. Say instead a liberal policy is enacted, the circle continues as normal. President goes on to the next person, Chancellor continues on, and the game continues. At this point, the liberal president will offer the choice in order to win the game. The fascist cannot and will not be able to put that liberal in or else they will lose. Congratulations, you have outed one of the fascists without any suspicion being placed on anybody else throughout the rest of the game. The circle normally demands that you shoot the person behind you, but now that we have guaranteed that this person is a fascist, just shoot them. With one guaranteed fascist dead, the circle continues as normal. President out, chancellor in. The next three cards are drawn. One of them is a liberal with two liberals in power. That means a choice is given and a liberal choice is given. The game is over, the liberals have won and no suspicion was placed on any of the liberal players at any given point in time. The only way there would have been is if a fascist president looked at one of their party cards and outed them as a fake fascist, but it wouldn't have mattered. And that's the gist of how the circle works. Disclaimer. As this removes the ability for the fascists to sow and the ability for the liberals to grow suspicious, this strategy ends up removing about 80% of the draw of the game, which is why the strategy was banned in our group for not only making it so easy for the liberals to win, but also for just generally making the game unfun to play. So be careful with doing it with your friends, because they will start to hate it after a little bit. And that's the lore, rules, and special strategies behind how to play Secret Hitler. Tell me if you're ready to start becoming the Hitler you've always wanted to be, and if you want to give the circle a try with your friends. And of course, thank you for watching, and have a fantastic day.